Good afternoon and weather to, uh, welcome to another Reliability Roadmap web workshop. My name is Terrence O'Hanlon. I'm the publisher at Reliability Web and Uptime Magazine, and it's my pleasure to be your host and your moderator for today. If you are looking for the web workshop Pass 55, Change Management, you're in the right place. The British Standard Institute's publicly available specification 55, Pass 55, provides organizations with a framework for establishing good practices in asset management. In the eighth installment of APG's popular Pass 55 theme webinar series, APG will help attendees identify key stakeholders in the implementation of Pass 55 and provide an overview of some practical techniques, tips, pitfalls related to managing the organizational change associated with the Pass 55 implementation. Today, the learning point goals of this web workshop are that you will learn asset management requires the involvement of many functional groups and stakeholders in the organization. You'll also learn that if improperly addressed, change management is one of the key aspects of PASS 55 implementation that can cause the initiative to fail. And lastly, uh, but not least, change management requires the use of collection of tools and techniques to be successful. Today we're very fortunate to have as our web workshop leader, James Nesbitt, principal service delivery of the Asset Performance Group. James uh, specializes in successful implementation of asset management improvements across many industry verticals. As a managing principal for the Asset Performance Group, he has spent over 15 years in senior positions focusing primarily on maintenance and reliability field within asset management. With a broad experience base in maintenance best practices, business process improvement, and maintenance technology implementations. James has conducted numerous technical seminars on asset management best practices and is a frequent speaker at prestigious national and international uh, conferences, including Reliability Web, the American Nuclear Society, the Society for Maintenance Reliability Professionals, and the Paper Industry Management Association. James's core belief is that in order to be successful, any asset improvement initiative must show quantifiable business returns early on and sustain momentum through the application of training, key performance indicators, and change management techniques. Um, before we begin, we just want to take a moment to remind you, if you have not done so, to request your free subscription to Uptime Magazine online at www.uptimemagazine.com. If you're uh, more high-tech and you already have your iPad or iPhone, you can simply go to the App Store, and if you have one of those, you know what that is, and just search Uptime, and you can get uh, the Uptime app, which is two years worth of Uptime. Uh, magazines on your portable device. Two um, conferences we also want to remind you about, the Reliability Forum for Water and Wastewater uh, Utilities, June 14th through the 17th, um, and PASS 55, uh, where um, James and um, uh, some of his folks at APG are going to be presenting, uh, PASS 55 2011 on July 11th through the 14th in um, Fort Myers, Florida. You can get more information at maintenanceconference.com and uh, we'd, we'd very much like to see you at that conference. To our knowledge, that's the first one in North America dedicated to that. And without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Adam and um, James from APG. You guys should have the presentation now. Let me know if you can see the screen, Terry. Yep, you can see it. Okay, perfect, sounds good. Very, uh, thanks very much, Terry, appreciate it. This is Adam Gron talking. Uh, I uh, work with James over here at the Asset Performance Group. I am the Principal for Business Development uh, with APG. I just wanted to do a, a quick introduction of uh, the organization, and uh, Terry did a, a wonderful job of inter inter introducing James there, so I don't know that I need to say a heck of a lot more other than to say that uh, we really appreciate James spending the time uh, to put together this uh, uh, presentation for you folks. Uh, hopefully you find it uh, very useful. Uh, this is the eighth, as uh, Terry mentioned, this is the eighth in our series of Pass 55 themed webinars, and we certainly welcome your feedback on any of these webinars as we go forward. James, if you can just click through the slide there. We've got the, the goldfish on the screen. There we go. Uh, so the just to, to introduce the organization very briefly, um, and then we'll jump into the meat of the uh, presentation. So who is the Asset Performance Group? Why should you bother listening to us here this morning? Uh, the Asset Performance Group is an endorsed assessor within the Institute for Asset Management scheme for managing uh, uh, PASS 55 specification. We are one of uh, very few uh, endorsed assessors in North America. Um, we, are, we do most of our work in North America, but we do have uh, access to uh, global customers. Uh, so we have a, a 
diverse range of uh, industry experience as well as um, uh, the ability to, to provide services to, to people throughout the world. Um, and that comes to, comes to bear when we talk about these types of webinars. Um, you know, we can bring a lot of that experience to the table. I'm sure you'll see that through James' discussion. I'm very much focused on implementation, and one of the things that is very important in implementation is change management, as everybody knows. And there's, you know, obviously no uh, black magic kind of uh, you know, scientific formula uh, for uh, managing change. There are just a lot of good activities we need to do, and James will also go through that with you. So we are part of a global network of, uh, of various practitioner groups. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work around asset management and maintenance and reliability. I'm more than happy to talk to you about any of that at any time. But uh, without further ado, I'll pass it off to James, and he can take you through this, this webinar. Thanks very much. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, today's agenda is uh, an overview of PAS 55. For those of you that are unaware of the specification or just starting to seek information on it, I'm going to go through it at a fairly high level in the beginning. And then we're going to talk about change management. Um, specifically the principles of change, and then the five elements of change as we see them. And then there'll be some time at the end for question and answer. Now, change management is a very, very broad topic, and we have, uh, I think, 40 minutes here to bring you through a high-level um, overview of change management and some of the key elements that you need to focus on through any change initiative. I'm going to tie as much of it back to PAS 55 specifically as I can, um, um, but a lot of this is, is um, high-level change management, which I said is very, very important to every initiative. <clears throat> so the publicly available specification in the past, it was developed by the Institute of Asset Management prior to 2004, and it is administered by the British Standards Institute. So the British Standards Institute um, develops all of the collaterals and publishes the, uh, the specification, both one and two. Um, one thing that, that uh, is very, very important is that PAS is not regarded as a standard. It is simply a specification. PAS 55 was first published in 2004, and, and every time it's published, it has two parts. The first one is just a, a thin guide, if you will, on what the requirements are, what, this, what the specification is. And the second one has some implementation guidance and, and uh, some advice or, and, and clarification of terms for each of the sections and is very, very valuable. In 2006, they came out with the assessment methodology. Um, the assessment methodology allows people to plot where they are relative to maturity on an asset management level. Interestingly enough, it was published in 2006, but the first endorsed assessors didn't appear until 2010, so that they had those four years to refine the Refine, refine the uh, assessment methodology, and they did that by going to a number of different industries and, and uh, gathering feedback and making the changes where it was required. In 2007, it became an off-gem requirement, with the, which is the Office for Gas and Electric Markets in the UK. And, and requirement, I think, is a, a fairly, strong, uh, fairly strong term. Um, the information that I've been able to gather is that it's not a requirement. It's just a very, very strong recommendation that PADS 55 will help organizations in those industries become more disciplined around asset management. In 2008, we have the current version. Um, it was an update of both Parts 1 and Parts 2 based on feedback, as we can see here, from a number of organizations across in industry sectors. Some exciting news around PAS 55 is that ISO has, has decided to go ahead with an asset management specification, and the teams have been, are being formed, and they've had the initial uh, meeting, I believe, in Australia to talk about the, the uh, ISO standard. So we should see that in the next three to five years. Interestingly enough, um, from an asset management perspective or from an ISO perspective, there was a fast tracking of the ISO specification based on the work that was done in PAS 55 and the desire from industry for some guidance on asset management. So what is asset management? Um, often when I'm talking to people about asset management, they confuse it with maintenance best practices or in some cases uh, uh, financial portfolios. Asset management, I love this definition, is the core business for organizations that are heavily dependent on physical equipment, systems, and infrastructure. So if your business 
is dependent on equipment to produce a product or to move a product, then asset management is your core business. It's not just operations. It, it encompasses the entire life cycle of your operations, including acquisition or creation of, of a physical asset base, operation or utilization of those assets, maintenance of those assets, and, and then eventually disposal or renewal of those assets. So it encompasses um, the entire life cycle of any physical asset. Some of the key principles, I threw this slide on here just, just to show that it was a very holistic view of, of your organization from asset management. And a few key points here is that PAS 55 outlines what needs to be done and not necessarily how to do it. Um, it defines good practice and not best practice. There's a recognition that best practices will differ certainly across industries and within industries depending on variables such as market condition or, or labor relations. Um, all components of this puzzle need to be fully integrated in order to be effective. So it's, uh, each one of these six is a, is a leg on the chair, if you will, or a leg on the table and, and all need to be in place in order for this to, to be successful. Asset management. So if we look at what asset management is, we'll have business drivers coming in on the left-hand side, and those can be things like risk or policies or, or, or corporate objectives. And what we want, of course, is a desired outcome of the other side. In order to facilitate that, we have to look at all of the, all of the drivers or inputs that are going to affect our ability to be successful. So information drivers. Do we have the information that we need in order to make clear decisions that are going to affect our ability to capitalize in a market or our ability to, uh, to uh, change the direction of our business or sustain the direction of our business. Things like financial drivers, what are our costs? Are we getting the most we can out of our, our equipment? Do we have a capital investment criteria or strategy for, for uh, both maintenance of the existing asset base as well as growth? Some intangible drivers around reputation, image, employee morale. Um, um, very, very important, but, but often hard to quantify. What we're going to focus on today is the human drivers, the uh, communication and, and teamwork and management, management motivation, um, those elements that are key to successful change management. Throughout PAS 55, we'll see the continuous improvement cycle. Plan, do, check, and act. And all elements of PAS 55 end with the, with the continuous improvement cycle. PAS 55 is a journey. And when we, when we coach people on PAS 55 certification or even PAS 55 implementation or gap assessment, we like to coach it as it is, it is a, a, a journey, not a goal to become certified. Certification will occur when you, start to, when you start to put all of the pieces together in the framework or the roadmap, if you will. So as we go around, we can see policies, strategy, objectives, and plans, and then asset enablers and controls, of course, implementation of the plans, and then performance assessment, identifying opportunities for review, for, for improvement, um, through management review, and then again through the plan, do, check, act cycle. A couple quotes that I had that I found were very, very interesting. Jack Welch, CEO of, G, of GE some time ago, said, when the rate of change outside exceeds the rate of change inside, the end is in sight, meaning that there are often variables outside of your control, market conditions, economic factors, competition, uh, consumer or industrial needs, that if you're, not, um, if you're not aware of, then the end is in sight. It's really a change or die. An organization should be, through a, should be in a constant state of change in order to stay both current and competitive and on the leading edge of whatever industry you're in. I had a boss some time ago, Brian Jackson, and he's, uh, he's been a, a wealth of quotes for myself. And I remember talking to him about <clears throat> change management, and he said that there's only way, two ways to establish change in an organization. You can either change the people or you can change the people. And uh, as, I, as I've gone through my journey of, of implementations, improvement, and change management, I found that at the core that this is very, very true. So what are some of the principles of change? 
resistance to change, of course, is, is, is something that uh, all of us will see as we go through our, our change management trials. All of us have been involved in change in one way or another. And often the difficulty is the perception of others. Whether it's true or not, um, there can be many different variables that lead people to resist. Often, low management commitment. It becomes the flavor of the month. We're doing this because we were told to do this, and if I passively resist it, it'll go away, just like all the rest. A lack of trust, um, often when we're engaged in organizations, especially around asset management, there's a feeling from, from the workforce and even management itself that this change is going to affect the way they do work, perhaps even their job directly. Um, a lack of understanding of what's in it for me. Why are we doing this? Why should I change the way that we've, uh, we've always done things? What we've done has gotten us to where we are now, and we've always been successful. So why is there a need for this change? As change agents, we need to, we need to focus on passive resistance. That's the, that's the biggest one for, for me that I've, that I've had experience in, is the wait and it'll go away. Past experience. Being, being open and understanding why prior initiatives may have, uh, may have been less than successful. Another condition that I see are, are a number of different initiatives. And the workforce or the resources are spread very, very thin trying to do a number of different initiatives um, um, based on improvement or based on work process or based on based on uh, other drivers within the organization, and they see this as this change is just more work. Um, the, bottom, the bottom bullet there, change strategies are situational. There are no silver bullets. There is no roadmap for do A, B, C, D, and you will be successful. It is, it is really a soft skill, and you need to understand the organization and where individuals and departments are within the organization in order to really affect change. Five elements of change. In the middle, we have motivating change. And it's in the middle for a reason. It's because motivating that change needs to occur throughout any initiative or step change. Um, the vision, and I'm going to go into each one of these in a little bit more detail, but a vision needs to be clear, and it needs to define the end state of where we're going. You also need to be very, very careful that you're not boiling the ocean, that what you're trying to do isn't too large, that you're taking, you're taking baby steps that are achievable. Developing support, making sure that management is on board for, for the initiative, and they understand what is required from them. Um, management, as well as, as the middle layer and the doers in the organization, need to understand what is coming and what is coming and what it means to them. Managing the transition. When transitioning, the organization must move quickly to deal with gaps. And there may be things that come up, that, or there will be things that come up that weren't expected. And as we move through, through any change, we need to be open and honest and, and acknowledge both the successes as well as the challenges, and then deal with those challenges in an open and honest fashion, and as well as being timely. And then, of course, five, sustaining. Uh, sustaining, to me, is really this is the way that we do work now. This is the way that, uh, that it's going to be, so walking the walk, if you will. These five elements are equal to change management. So if we look at the first one, motivating change. What's really important is that you have a clear understanding of the need for change. Um, we call it creating a tension for change or a, a burning platform, if you will, a, a compelling reason for doing something. Now, this reason needs to be based both on data and must be emotionally and intellectually appealing to the organization. Using the PAS 55 assessment criteria is an excellent tool. Because PAS 55 is a framework for all of asset management, it can help us really identify what areas we may be weak in and why, and what areas we may be strong in to help us to, uh, to evaluate where we should start and what the change should look like. PAS 55 has five, diff or five different maturity levels, of course, zero being absolutely unaware 
and uh, and and no understanding of of Pat 65 and, and asset management as a core strength of an organization. And maturity level four being surpassing asset management, being on the leading or the bleeding edge, if you will. Uh, I see here we have, we have a poll question for, for motivating change. So Terry? Terry? All right. Yep, I'm here. Sorry. Okay. Just trying to get it launched here. Um, all right. He, I, and I was trying to figure out how to read this, too. So you fill in the blank with this one, and that's what your choice is going to be. So awareness, development, blank, and then excellence. And then for the blank, it's learning or sustaining or competence or, ma or mastery. Excuse me. So just choose one of those for the fill in the blank. Awareness, development, learning sustaining, competence or mastery, and then excellence. So we're trying to fill in the blank. I'm going to give it about five more seconds. And now we're going to go ahead and close. Um, James and Adam, 24% um, said the blank is learning. So awareness, development, learning, then excellence. 33% um, said uh, sustaining. So it's awareness, development, sustaining, then excellence. 33% um, said competence. Awareness, development, competence, then excellence. 10% said mastery. Awareness, development, mastery, and then excellence. So um, sustaining and competence each got 33%, and those were the largest single block answers. Excellent. The, the results of these are always surprising to me. So, uh, so excellent. I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, motivating change. I like this chart because it really tells the story of what people go through um, during a, uh, a change initiative. So on the left-hand side, we can see confidence over time. Um, in the beginning, there's often a, a kickoff and a lot of focus put, in, put onto initiatives. So we can build some confidence that people are going to be a part of this. As, as we start to get going, we often see people are overwhelmed. And that's often due to a number of different initiatives that are going on. In most organizations, they don't focus on one or two. Um, there's a number of different, uh, different challenges that are occurring at the same time. As I mentioned before, this can spread the resources very, very thin. What management needs to do here is really prioritize what it is that they're trying to do, avoid um, trying to boil the ocean, and focus on those things that are going to bring the biggest bang to the buck, big, biggest bang for their buck. Um, as we move along this grid, we see uh, I'm not sure what's going on. So people have taken a risk. They've they've placed themselves into perhaps a, a uh, uh, change change agent role where they're leading some of the change and now what they're looking for is support some early successes can can beef up the confidence but there will be a time when there is a dip we can't do this it won't won't work we're not allowed we're not giving we're not uh, we're not getting the proper support or this is somebody else's problem laying blame Using successful management, uh, change management techniques such as conflict resolution or stakeholder analysis and, and increased communication, we can help lessen this dip. Celebrating some of the success may get us to actually things are getting better and a realization that uh, what we're doing is having an effect on the organization. As we start to celebrate those successes and support the people through it, both from the from the initiative core team or working team, if you will, and the organization as a whole, everybody begins to see some confidence, and and the, the project team or the or the or the governance team moves into a consulting role, and uh, and and helps with the sustain. Creating a vision of change, so creating a shared, defined, robust view of the imperatives for change. Why are we doing this? Why is it important? What impact is it going to have on our, our, our corporation or our company as a whole? Is it going to make us more, more, uh, more competitive? What impact is it going to have on me and my job? Why should I, why, why should I participate? So a, a vision needs to be based on, on very sound data that is 
both intellectually and emotionally attractive to the individuals that are going through it. It has to have a focus of what's in it for me. Why, why am I going to get involved? And then you have to decide on the vehicle for change. What are we going to look at in what order? Is the, uh, is the, the, the rate of change that we're looking at both realistic and sustainable? Can we introduce a step change into the organization and celebrate success in the near term? So many projects start off with a, with a grand vision and then go sit in a, in a, in a project office or a, often referred to as an ivory tower for a year or 18 months and the, and the organization is unaware of what's going on. This is a disaster for, for uh, any project and communication and early results are, are key to any initiatives of success, especially as the design. In order to create a vision of change, it needs to be driven from the top down. So here we can see the PAS 55 really overview diagram from the organizational strategic plan driving down into policy, strategy, and objectives. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How is that aligned to the direction of our organization? And how are each, each, each department, each group, and each individual going to contribute to those goals? When creating a vision to change, it's four steps. We need to enroll advocates from the organization. We need to get people involved. We need to get them excited and motivated as to, as to why they want to be a part of this understand what the end game is and what that's going to mean to them, um, helping, helping them understand what the future looks like and what their part will be, enabling them. This is key, ensuring that they have the proper practices, processes, and technology in order to be successful, that they have the tools in order to, in order to uh, successfully implement the change, but also that there's a focus on some of the soft skills whether it be through presentation or conflict resolution or communication, energizing them, um, building and sustaining people's energy. These people, the people on the, on, the, on the working and the review teams need to be clear advocates for what you're doing and need to engage the organization in a very open and honest way around what we're trying to do, what hasn't worked in the past, what successes we've seen going through the exercise, as well as being, being honest about what challenges we may, have, we may have run against and how we're going to, how we're going to overcome them. And then exemplifying, this is uh, really related to the leadership at all levels, whether it be at the senior level, the middle level, or, or at the uh, tactical level, demonstrating and, and, and walking the walk, if you will, around the change. So often, um, through, through change initiatives in PAD 55, it's no different. As soon as things, when things are going good, there's lots of celebration and confidence in what we're doing. But as, as we uh, come up against a roadblock or perhaps, a, perhaps an emergency, the, the knee-jerk reaction of the people in the organization is to go back to what they were doing, to what always worked, to what they were comfortable with. So it's very, very important that we, that we walk the walk and that uh, we handle situations, even tough, tough situations, when they come up based on how we've agreed to change. Some of the key features around creating a vision of change is that it's defined or designed around the business drivers, that we have clear data and a compelling, a compelling reason to go forward. It wins emotional and intellectual support. It models and enforces a new way of working. That's not to say that would need it's always right uh, when you implement it. There's always continuous improvement. And, and recognizing those opportunities to improve, communicating to the organization, and being a part of a part of the initiative and the change at the tactical level will win a lot of support when people start to give input back and they see some positive return coming from it. Um, it creates experiences that shape uh, future behavior. Um, and the bottom one, it releases talent, creativity, and ingenuity. I've often been surprised with, with people on the working team or, or somewhere in the organization that once there seems to be some success and they feel that they're being supported and understand where they're going, that they become a lot more innovative and creative when, uh, when, and when willing to take risk when dealing with, with change and, and, uh, and new ways of 
developing support. Now, I get this. I got this comment about uh, about three months ago, and uh, and I was very very impressed. I've left it anonymous simply because I I haven't asked him for his permission to use it, but it it really rang true with me. So, when developing support. When asked what the single most important variable is on successfully introducing change in the organization, my answer is always the same. Whatever you decide to do, make sure you can complete it within the lifespan of your current management team. So if you're in an organization where there, there is a lot of business transformation, a lot of organizational change at the leadership levels, ensure that what you're doing is in small enough pieces that you can get it implemented and sustained before management changes. Usually, and I think all of us have probably been involved in management change in one way or another, when new management comes in, they'll take a look at what's currently going on. Of course, they'll bring a lot of new ideas with them. And often what happens is a begin again. Let's put the old initiatives on, on hold and we'll reevaluate them at a later date but now we've got new priorities. And, and stopping something halfway through really diminishes, of course, the momentum and the motivation for getting it and takes a lot of focus away from the importance and helps to build some of that flavor of the month mentality that is, that is in a lot of organizations. So ensuring that you have management support and that management support will continue throughout the life of the initiative is incredibly important. So how do we develop support? One of the tools that we use is, is four elements. Information. Do we have the information that, is, that, that, uh, that, that makes people aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it? Is there a clear reason to buy in? Is there a desire to do this? The perception. Are the project goals required? Um, um, is this something that we need to do? Is this something that's going to bring benefit to the organization or to me personally? And then, of course, feasibility, which I've I've uh, focused on quite a bit. Um, is it realistic? Is it achievable? Or is this another hairy fairy pie in the sky initiative that's uh, just going to go the way of the dodo bird like so many others? In the middle, we can see a, a misshapen circle. The larger that that circle is, and the, and, the, and the more round that circle is, the more successful, uh, more likely your initiative is to become successful. Another way to develop support is to do a stakeholder analysis. So understanding what the support for change is and the impact of that change. So uh, on the on the left on the left axis there we can see impact impact to change and, and on the bottom support for change. Stakeholder analysis will actually plot the key clip players in one of these in one of these squares on this on this uh, on this grid. And what's important is understanding where they are now and where we need them to go. So here we see the, the stakeholder analysis. We have what their commitment is, and we can see the, the, the delta or the triangle there is where they are today, and the circle is where we're trying to get them to go. And depending on the stakeholder, if we have, if we have a, a senior manager, for example, who is, who is in an organization that needs to support but not be involved, maybe just letting it happen is where we want him to be. If we move it down, if we move down the second line there, where we have no commitment, we need to move him to help make it happen, to be a part of the, part of the, part of the change. And this can be accomplished through, through uh, communication, information, uh, um, working sessions. Um, the bottom one is interesting there, where it's, we have somebody who is willing to lead it and, and sees the need for it, but may not be in a position in the organization um, to, to really be effective in leading that change. So sometimes you actually have to scale some, some people back. This grid really helps us with a, with a concept that we call pre-wiring, understanding where everybody is and then putting a strategy together to bring them on board, to understand what their issues are, to document those, and move through them. Either it, often it's communication or more information, and sometimes we even change the approach based on the based on the knowledge or the commitment levels of the of the specific stakeholders. Developing support. So here, here, here we're looking at 
in the middle, why should I change my behaviors? And the different things that we can do in order to affect that change. Um, we started on the right-hand side there around grapevine. The grapevine or the, or the rumor mill within an organization is incredibly powerful and in some cases um, dictates the focus of a lot of time of the change management team. What is being said, addressing the rumors, um, um, acknowledging those that are true, and changing the understanding. This is often done through, through workshops or toolbox, toolbox meetings where people can be open and honest about, about what they're hearing and what their fears are and they can be addressed. New systems and processes. If we buy a new piece of software or a tool but we change the way things are done, that has about a 25% effect on, on why we should do this. Yeah, sure, I have to do it because there's a new system and now I have to enter all my data into this, into, into, uh, this new tool. Um, but not on its own an effective change management um, vehicle. There's media. Uh, intranets, uh, online surveys, newsletters, emails, um, about 10% effective. Most, um, I'm not sure most people, I know when I get a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, information in my email, I will skim through it. And often it's the first stuff that I'll cull when I'm very, very busy. So media can't be the only one that you depend on. It requires face-to-face -face, um, interaction between leadership and and the worker. Um, here we see leadership at 65%. Leadership needs to show commitment. They need to walk the walk. They need to they need to enforce good behaviors, and they need to coach when they see when they see behaviors that are are not desirable. Uh, one story I have around uh, change management was a large change initiative, which included. Uh, uh, behavioral activities that included SAP implementation and also included some business transformation at the same time. So a lot of things happening at the organization. And I remember my leader coming down and saying, you know, there's all this stuff happening, guys, so we need to make sure that we're on board. What we need to do is learn all the new acronyms. Don't you guys worry about what you're doing. It's always been great. But, uh, but management wants this change, so we have to take our old car and paint it red to, make, to, to show that we're committed to this. But don't you guys worry. Everything you're doing is great, and it won't affect you at all. So you can imagine how successful that was for the first, for the first few years as we went through this large change in the organization. Carrie, I believe there's another poll question. Which of the following is the most important variable for developing support? Leadership, media, the grapevine, or systems and processes? Which of the following is, most, was, is the most important variable for developing support? Is it leadership, is it media, is it grapevine, or is it systems and processes? Let me take a moment and indicate. Everybody's jumping on this one, so I'm going to give it about five more seconds. Go ahead and close. Here we go. And James, on this web workshop, 88%, which is by far the single uh, biggest block of answers, said leadership. 0% um, said media. 4% uh, said grapevine. 8% said systems and processes. But 88% said leadership. Yeah, that, that answer really doesn't surprise me at all. Everywhere that I go, um, management commitment and, and management support of a change is identified as, as one of the barriers to success, both from the initiative that we're, we're, we're currently involved in, as well as a lot of past baggage that they're bringing. And often, a, a poor leadership many, many years ago, even if the organization and the people have changed, still continues to leave a bad taste or, or apprehension in, in the minds of the minds of the rest of the organization. I'm not sure if you're back to me yet, Karen? Yep, it's, it's all back to you. Sorry, James. Perfect. Managing the transition. So here we talk about the phase, the content of those phases, and the outcomes. Now, this is an overarching um, um, timeline. And often we'll go through this unfreeze, mobilize, realize, reinforce, and sustain um, cycle many times within an initiative. 
but they're focused on smaller components of it. So whether it be policy development or, or strategy development within PAS 55, we will go through this, this cycle many, many times. So unfreezing, again, is, is setting the direction, creating the desire and attention for change, changing the way they per, people perceive what we're doing, and outlining what the benefit or what the opportunity is in, in doing something different. Mobilizing, making early changes and building, building confidence. Don't get stuck into the, in, the, in, the project, in the project room planning around what you're going to do. Have a clear plan, be willing to take some risk, and, and, and go and make changes earlier so that people can see that it's happening and that there's support for it happening. As we move into realization, we, we start to secure a widespread shift in behavior. Most of the organization has reached critical mass, and we're starting to move uh, towards the, the new way of doing it. Then, of course, reinforcing it, underpinning it with structured people and processes to ensure that it's, it's got the, the support that it needs and avoid reverting back to the way we've always done things. And then, of course, sustaining, striving for continuous improvement um, um, in everything that we do. As we're going through transition, there's a number of different levels that people will go through. And we've all seen that graph, which I think it's called the value, val, val, uh, valley of despair, where we start with anger and despair, and, and then on the other side, realization and ownership. So here we're talking about really level of change, awareness all the way up to ownership of the, of the engagement. And what's really important is along the bottom, the change management techniques that we can use to help move the organization through this transition. So tell, sell, consult, and join. And some of the tools that we can use early on, we're looking for, we're looking to build awareness and understanding of where we're going and how we're going to do that. We can do that through newsletters, emails, through through the development of business cases or or uh, past 55 assessments to understand where the gaps are and of course what the opportunity is for improving those. As, as we move up into understanding, yes, we understand we should do some of this stuff, we need to sell it. Why should you be involved? What's it going to mean to you? We can, we can do that uh, through presentations. The intranet is a, an excellent way to do that, but also a lot of face-to-face. -face. And this is where leadership needs to be you nose-to-nose know, -nose with those people that are, that are uh, going through the change, whether they're involved with it directly or whether they're, they're, they're going to be affected by it. As we start to move through the maturity, we begin to consult. The organization begins to uh, um, grasp ownership, if you will, of the initiative. They're starting to take a little bit more risk. Perhaps their boundaries of operations are being expanded because they're becoming more comfortable in their role. They've seen some um, early successes and, and, and are moving it forward. So the organization starts to move into a consulting role. Here's, here's some of the things that you can do in order to be successful, perhaps some conflict resolution, perhaps some of the soft skills. And then, of course, when we've, when we've affected the step change, joining in on it, ensuring that we're looking at continuous improvement and that there's workshops and everybody is, is uh, uh, performing in the new environment. Um, on the left, we see we see a, another another uh, a graph that brings us through commitment. So over time, we see awareness, understanding, uh, acceptance, and then commitment or ownership. How do we get there? One of the tools that we use is to develop a, go a governance body. And if we start at the bottom, we have the working group. Now, those are the individuals that are going to lead the change. That are going to that are going to get the. The, uh, the initial training and the skills that they need to be successful from a practice and a process and perhaps even a technology perspective. Um, their boundaries are going to be set, of course, by the review team. The review team is ultimately responsible for the outcome of the initiative. So their, their, their role is to, is to guide the working team and to remove any roadblocks that may be there. Ultimately, there's a reporting to the steering committee, um, usually made up of senior managers. And usually, the steering committee um, is focused on the results, whether they be whether they be financial or qualitative. <clears throat> Most times, 
we have a structure similar to the top two here. We'll have a project lead, whether it's internal or external. And they'll be responsible for, you know, of course, project management and, and some communication and business results focus. Um, we'll have some practice leads, those that can lead us through new tools or techniques that we're going to apply through the change. Of course, there's some training and mentoring and knowledge transfer to to both the, the people on the governance team as well as the organization as a whole. What's really important about these two groups is that they are typically focused on the completion of the tasks and they're typically focused on the project plan. What do we have to get done by where? Are we on time? Are we on budget? Um, and and are we getting the results that, that, that we set out to get? The bottom one, the resource lead, is something that, that uh, we've often seen left out and quite honestly is something that we've often left out and, and had to bear the consequence of. The resource lead, because the working team is a new team and they're not perhaps used to working with one another, um, what, what further complicates this is that the working group will be, will be uh, working very, very closely with the review team who are often made up of more senior people. So there's some difficulty in communication, there's some difficulty in boundaries or empowerment. So the resource lead really focuses on the soft skill and, and creates a relationship both with the groups on how they can, they can work more effectively as well as the individual. Um, on the bottom there, it's somewhere to surrender. Uh, if, if a member or a team is having difficulty making changes or, or, or affecting um, the implementation of PAS 55 or a specific practice or enabler within it, that there's some place that they can go to say, well, we've tried this and we weren't successful because of this, and we tried that and we tried that. This person seems to be a barrier and get some advice and some, and some personal coaching and strategy um, on the soft skills in order to move that forward. So focusing not so focusing um, on the interpersonal relationships really, and not just the tasks. Sustaining, providing resources for change. This has been a barrier in a lot of the a lot of the organizations that uh, that that I've seen. Um, trying to fit a new process or practice into an existing structure and not properly, not properly resourcing it. Often when we start, we don't know what the resources are going to look like at the end. So it's very, very important that we, that we look at that as we start to move forward and that we resource appropriately. Building a support system, ensuring that the tools and the practices as well as the coaching and the consulting and the, and, and the, and the information they need to be successful is available to them. Of course, continuous improvement, developing new skills, looking at things in, a, in, in perhaps a different light, or applying more, more sophisticated practices. Reinforcing new behaviors, um, celebrating success, and, and, uh, and, and coaching where there may be weaknesses. And uh, finally, showing commitment, walking the walk, not slipping back to where we were. Um, interesting enough, uh, Terry and I were talking about this a little bit before the webinar started. An organization will often go through some change, and then when they've seen a little bit of success, say, oh, we're there. We can stop now. We don't need to do this anymore. So showing commitment all the way through is incredibly important in order to avoid uh, passive resistance or, or flavor of the month. So when sustaining? What, do we, what are some of the elements that we need? Of course, uh, number one, leader attention, measurement, rewards, and controls. So, so I focused a lot of that in this webinar that, that leaders need to be bought in. And wherever possible, pre-wire um, each of the key individuals so that they understand what their commitment needs to be, what it means to them, and what behaviors they need to show. And this is really where that resource lead comes in to help them demonstrate some of that. Leader reaction to critical incidents, not slipping back to our to, to our old habits or where we're comfortable, um, but following the, the new change through the good times as well as some of the challenging times. Leader role modeling and coaching. A criteria for recruitment, promotion, retirement. It means making sure that we have some succession planning, that we're not um, dependent on a few key people or prima donnas or, or even worse, the consultants to bring this forward. 
formal and informal socialization. So the change should be a part of everything that you do. Um, I've seen a, a, a really good example of an organization, and that was Dryers in Baltimore, where, where as part of their policy development, that policy was linked to everything that they did. So before they started a meeting, they would talk about what the outcomes of the meeting were supposed to be and how it linked to the direction or the change in their organization. Um, again, organizational design and structure, making sure that, that your organization is structured to support the change and you're not trying to backfit it. Design of physical space, of course, that we have the, the, the tools and the, and the uh, environment we need to be successful. Story and myth, stories and myths about key people and events. <clears throat> Making sure that we control the rumor, rumor mill, that, that uh, management, the, the organization as a whole, and the project team are open and acknowledge any challenges that they may be having and, and, and seek feedback for how to, how to make things better. And then, of course, formal statements, charts, and codes of ethics. Where are we going? What are we expecting to do? Um, not surprisingly, between 80 and 90% of the behavior is determined by the first three points, and it's all around uh, leadership commitment to change. And I think we have our last, our last poll, Harry. All righty, here we go. What percentage of behavior is determined by leader attention, measurements, and rewards? Is it 20 to 25%? Is it 40 to 50%? Is it 80 to 90%, or is it 100%? Take a moment to indicate. Everybody's jumping on this one pretty good. So we're going to give it five more seconds. What percentage of behavior is determined by leader attention, measurement, and rewards? And we're going to go ahead and close. <laughs> James, uh, no one answered uh, 20 to 25 percent. Only 5% of the participants answered 40 to 50%. 90% of the participants answered 80 to 90%. And that's the largest single block answer. And 5% answered 100%. Yes, I, again, that's not a, that's not a surprising uh, a result because most organizations I go into, it's, it's a lack of leadership attention or focus or commitment to, to prior initiatives that is seen as the biggest concern for going forward. So, so uh, excellent that the people have recognized that. Uh, finally, why, why did they fail? So before we start anything, it's, it's important that, uh, that we understand what the top ten reasons are that initiatives or any change initiative fail. Of course, not surprisingly, number one is lack of management report, saying one thing and doing another. Um, Number two, a large project without clear goals. Um, I've seen this um, many, many times in my career, where we're trying to we're trying to boil the ocean or trying to eat the elephant all in one bite. It's very, very important again that on on any initiative that we break it down into clear, realizable elements that all contribute to the end goal, and we don't try to go from 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 zero to hero, if you will, inside of a very, very short time frame. Confusion between the ends and the means. Why are we doing this? Where are we going? And what does it mean to me? Um, Short-term perspective. So this, uh, this really hits on some of the stuff that Terry and I were talking about. It takes three to five years for, orga for an organization to change. And through that, you're going to have to, the leadership needs to show absolute commitment to what we're doing. And, and there needs to be a, a, a process in place in order to address any, any issues that may came, come up or opportunities to improve what we're doing. Lack of organization between different activities. So as I've mentioned before, often in organizations there's lots of things going on. It's very important that you prioritize what you're doing and stop those that are, that are of, of less value or perhaps delay your, uh, your current initiative until you have the focus of the organization. Large gap between commitment of change at the top of the organization and transfer to the middle of the organization. And it's the middle layer that's often forgotten um, and often one of the most important. If we're looking at asset management around operations and maintenance, 
it's the middle layer that really controls what is being done. So it's a very, very important to get them on 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 uh, on board. Of any initiative that I've had that that uh, was less than successful, it was the middle organization and the lack of attention towards the middle organization that led to led to uh, led to issues or dissension. Trying to fit an old organize into an old organizational structure. The desire for a silver bullet. If we just do this, then then we'll be happy. Or um, James, you guys have done this before. Just give us the just give us the package version and we'll be okay. There are no there are no silver bullets either for change for for best practices initiatives or for change management. It is very very uh, specific to what you're doing and the people in your organization and the environment as a whole at the time that you're doing it. And then of course the desire to lay blame or responsibility. Um, this is this is an operations initiative and, and doesn't affect us and we will uh, we'll wait till we're told what to do. Um, or uh, the consultants came in here, did a bunch of work and left and then it fell apart. So they are they are to blame. So ensuring that we have proper communication, that there's accountability throughout the organization. Now that was a very, very high level overview of change management. Um, change management, like I said in the beginning, is a very, very broad uh, category, so I hope I did it justice in the 45 minutes that I had. Um, as Terry mentioned in the beginning, we've done, uh, this is the eighth webinar that we've done. Um, we have plans, of course, to continue doing them through throughout the rest of this year. Um, we haven't picked the next um, session yet, so if there's something that you're, spe that you're specifically interested in relative to PAS 55, please just send us a, 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 an email or include it on your comments for this um, webinar, and we'll be sure to, to take a look at it and gear our, our webinars to what it is you're interested in. Um, www.apgassetcare.com. You can, you can uh, download the completed webinars and get, get uh, details on, on upcoming webinars. You can also provide feedback there or suggestions for future webinars. All of these webinars are also available on reliabilityweb.com. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much, James. You did a great job, in case you were wondering. Um, it's a very difficult topic, like you say, very comprehensive topic. And if I might add a personal note, I will say one that I think that maintenance and reliability professionals tend to um, um, not give its proper due. We tend to be a technical solution community, um, and we, you know, we like technical solutions. A, when it comes to the human solutions versus technical solutions, the technical solutions, no matter how complex, are much easier than the human solution. Um, yes. And I, I think that you know your your points are extremely poignant. Um, you know, we've seen lots of technical solutions that were perfectly valid fail because um, people didn't take change management into consideration. Um, so thank you. Uh, and, and I study and read about it a lot, and I got a lot from today's workshop, so I just want to thank you for that personally. Um, Thanks, Gary. We, we, can, um, we do have some time for some questions. I believe James has a few minutes here. We're running just about to the edge. Um, some logistics that this will be, we'll send you a direct link to this one. Um, in addition to being able to go to APG Asset Care, we'll have this particular website, I mean this particular web workshop online within 24 hours and you, you'll get a direct link to that. Um, we do urge you to have all your coworkers, people who you're working with, um, to, to watch this because it is a very powerful messaging. If you do want to get up to speed on PASS 55, go up to APG Asset Care and find those webinars because they've been great um, and you'll get a, a soup to nuts um, education uh, at no cost on PASS 55. I think some of you, it looks like, have been on, on a lot of these, but a few I've seen some new faces today too, new names. So uh, please do that, and um, uh, we would we would welcome that. And and as as James said, send them some send them some feedback on what you want to see regarding PASS 55 for the next topic. And don't forget, we're we're running the PASS 55 conference in July, um, and the APG folks will be there at that particular conference as well. Um, doesn't look like we've got any um, questions there. Uh, then in that case, I'm going to say um, a couple of things. Um, one, I, re I, I particularly liked the 80% number, 80 to 100% of the 
um, you know, relate back to leaders and how leaders actually um, behave uh, because that's what people look for is what, what are the leaders doing, how are they treating this project, and, and uh, how are they with this strategy. So I thought that was one of the particularly poignant things that you said in this particular workshop. So that was, uh, that was a high point for me. If there are any questions, Terry, please uh, just encourage people to put them on to the uh, feedback for this webinar or okay. just go to uh, uh, apgassacare.com and send an email to info at apgassacare.com and uh, we'll be sure to get back to them with, with specific answers to any questions that they have. Well, that's great. Well, um, uh, Adam and uh, James and I would like to take a moment and just thank the audience for their time and attention and for participating in the polls. And um, the audience and Uptime and Reliability Web would like to thank APG, um, as well as uh, Adam and, and James for taking the time today and sharing this educational web workshop with us. We very much appreciate it. Thanks, Terry. This is uh, Terry O'Hanlon at Reliability Web and Uptime Magazine signing off. Everybody have a great day.